a uh, Brussels likes to bring everyone over for what they call contract negotiation, and we were uh, thrown together in this uh, uh, interesting symbolic situation of they were building a building that we were inside and, and, and literally a construction site while we negotiated. And at the time, I thought that I actually, uh, first time I met you, I, I think I actually thought that there, there must be Northern Ireland must be included in, in, your, in your project. But then I think it could have been, it certainly easily could have been, but just by chance it wasn't. And the, the, the issues that Marie Louise's project looked at really was the, uh, really was cultural heritage, but then memorials became important as the project went on. And there's very obvious resonances with uh, Northern Ireland. And I, I think uh, today's talk uh, will be interesting to sort of see how these issues have uh, played out in other parts of Europe over the, the 20th century. Also, I think, uh, I think she's also going to talk a bit about really the, how research on issues like memorialization, uh, how this uh, can or cannot play into policy, both a practical policy of, of, of everyday politics, but also the more getting, getting back to our funders and making impacts in, in, in the policy realm in general. So I think we'll have a very interesting talk, and then uh, there'll be ample time for discussion. I'll also just uh, briefly mention that we, we do, uh, we'll conclude a, a around about an hour from now, and then uh, there's a lunch where you can, uh, a time for a chance of informal uh, talking to Mary Louise or networking amongst people. And the other thing, which I'll, if I leave it to the end, I'm almost bound to forget it. If uh, the, uh, we do have a little art pack, which uh, includes, among other things, an evaluation form, and it helps us very much to know who's attending and um, uh, to help us sort of uh, target our, our subsequent seminars. So uh, with no more to do, I think I'll turn over to Marie, Marie Louise. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. It's very exciting for me to this opportunity to share some of the things we learned on this project with you, with the very diverse experiences, uh, knowledge that you have. Uh, I thought I had slightly longer so I might have to skip some of the slides, uh, some of the, and I'm sorry also some of the things are text slides just to make the points. Uh, but let's see, I, will, I look forward to the discussion, so that's why I quite like to get through the talk relatively quickly. So this uh, project is an EU-funded project, and as Robert said, it's about cultural heritage and the reconstruction of identity after conflict. So very briefly, we were aiming <coughs> to investigate how the reconstruction of the cultural heritage after conflict actually impact identity, in, impact claims about and understandings about who one is, both as a person and as group. We were interested in exploring both tangible and intangible dimensions of heritage, and, uh, but mainly working through the tangible as a lot of the intangible aspects come up through that. And we wanted to use a case study approach and we used various kind of methods, including qualitative research method, a lot of field observation, and an enormous amount of archival work. So very similar to what a lot of you do, I think. These are the case studies. The orange ones are the core case studies, <coughs> and the yellow one was some which were added. <coughs> and the stretch in time from 1864 to uh, actually ongoing conflicts in, in uh, Bosnia. <coughs> So just to make that point that, the, that we are looking, we use the cultural heritage as our sort of uh, approach angle, so to speak. But through that, a lot of issues actually emerge and open up. And one of the things which became obvious very early was that the, her the memorial spaces and the associated memorial activities are actually a major versions of how cultural heritage, a heritage and understanding of conflict are moved into the present and into the future. So that became um, a larger part of the overall project than we had originally anticipated. Should we turn the light down a bit? Yeah, it's a good idea. If that's possible. Yeah. Is it here? Volume screen, is that it? No, the lower and raise. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, not even up to date, 
And I only in some way put this slide on to say, this is a little bit how you report to the EU. And then when you've done that, you realize you have sat very little. You just said you have worked so that you have the quantity of work in some way come to equate the number of pounds or euros you got. So in some way, you say we've done so much, we've done so many meetings, website, this and that, and so what? So it's a little bit this so what that I would like to focus on. What did we actually learn? And does it matter? In which way does it matter, the thing we learn? And I'll try very briefly to co talk you through the case studies <coughs> to give you a sense of what kind of um, historical, social, political situation we were looking at so you can think about what resonance it may have with the kind of thing you're working with. In Spain, we were looking at Guernica and different places in Madrid. The, the cases in Madrid, uh, both cases relate to the, uh, the civil war, but also to contemporary responses in various ways. So we looked at places in terms of transformation of them into sites of memory, including the constructions of myth, also how they become contested places and become places for competing memories. We have, and in several of our cases, we have civil war or war between ethnic group and that create this kind of very contested spaces where there are competing places. We can look at some of the processes, the silences of memory and, and the, how the act of memorialization or mourning can both become silenced and suppressed and the different roles it gains when it's expressed. The, we paid a lot of attention to the performance of public mourning and the extent to which their political claims are embedded into the ways they are performed, but also the development of grassroots memorials and the dynamics between public and state and grassroots activities, which sets get us to the issue of the politics of memory. So out of that, we became very concerned of things like memory scapes and heritage scapes, of the evolution of both real and symbolic spaces marked by the memory events of various kind. So this is just, uh, I'll do this a bit quickly, but this gives you sort of sense of how through our various kind of case studies, each of them highlight particular themes, <coughs> like in terms of Guernica, it's a political state setting in different ways. We have to use different kinds of methods, and then out of the result, we can sort of in detail see how this place become a pic particular memory event, and also a modern myth. And by modern myth, we are referring to, for example, that there were actually that the neighboring village was actually bombed before a few weeks before Guernica. No one remembers it, not even people in the areas. So one place become the place per excellence of the whole conflict. And we're trying to trace the process through which that happened. Another example of memorialization in Spain is the train bombing of the 11th of March in 2004, which very strongly illustrate that tension between the public uh, um, versus alternative, not even public-private, but the public and then various kind of grassroots communities trying to control the interpretation of what the event is about. So what they did, our, our, my partners there did, is that they collected all that sort of expression of the grassroots and had done a very thorough ethnographic research into who are, who are the people, who are the group who claims, take claims in these events, and how are they expressing that. They also used um, apps. So they tried to, out of this, develop different kind of apps, uh, um, users which give people access to the, to particular places, contested places, and the number and the degree of record which exists behind that. So I'll do that very quickly. Another case study is France, and that moves us into the understanding of landscape rather than buildscape. That landscape which come to represent loss and destruction which become a lutte memoir, 
and also give us the possibility of discussing some of the relationship between those places of memory uh, and actual places, physical landscapes, and the very physicality of that landscape, and also what happens through time, and te the temporal dimension of how we remember and what we do with the memory. So we are looking at the actual material manifestation of memorial landscape, uh, the particular kind of topographies that are created within that so that the actual battlefields become a friend's place, it also become a place of war, it become layered in terms of its meanings. And also the continuity of memorialization at a local level where some of the villages which were within the destroyed landscape were declared uh, dead for France, so they are martyrs. So in this case, it's places which are martyrs. It's not just people who can be martyrs. And they are being commemorated every year. And they still have mayors, even that the places uh, officially only exist as those martyred villages. But you also, in cases where we have that long history, gradually also see changes. And one of the very interesting changes in area around Verdun, for example, is that the nature in some way is taking over, where in the initial understanding, nature was something which was used to heal and to give rebirth. But now we're coming into a period where a very long-term process have happened. So there are now a biodiversity in the area, which means that it become a nature of, or an area of natural interest or scientific interest. So it's actually in a very unfor, unplanned for ways acquiring total new kind of connotations <coughs> and meaning and potential new kinds of values. So I think that's really quite striking in this particular case. So when we looked at the landscape of Adang, it become, in some way, the landscape itself become an actor. It become an actor of memory and identity creation. It uh, also a landscape which exists uh, somewhat independent of the social and political uh, rhetorics and discussions about identity. There are other things happening. And it's also one which illustrates very clearly some of the fractures between local and, and state narratives. Cyprus is a very obvious example of the ethnicization of heritage. In some way, when you have a society which is becoming divided and people are forced to decide whether they're Greek or whether they're Turkish, Everything about them have to be divided and categorized, including their heritage. So uh, in, in Cyprus, we were able to look at how that enforced division, which was working on old traditional divisions, but was making black and white things which had nuances before, how that affect the privileging in the protection of certain things, how it might lead to targeted destruction of certain kind of heritage, and also uh, heritage use of reconciliation or very kind of warp kind of claims that if you look after very well after the mosque, then you can say you look after your enemy's heritage and they don't look after the churches on the other side. So you get very interesting sort of competition happening, which at time privileges the heritage and at time is very detrimental to it. But it also by looking at actually the mm -hmm in a historical sense, the heritage scape, the history, the kind of identities which existed in Cyprus, then we have that, um, that there are identity which get trapped. There were identity which existed before, such as, for example, the um, Manorite, which there's no space for in any kind of political debate or political practice there is no space for any other kind of identities. So we have a, a situation here where people and heritage and everything else are squeezed into two square holes. I think that's about the same. And just take the last point here, and I think that brings up one of the greatest challenges in terms of rebuilding heritage or using heritage in, in this destroyed society. And that is about how one in any way can think about shared heritage. 
If you go into the past, there are in various ways shared heritage, but that heritage has been filtered through contemporary political processes, which make it a divisive heritage. And one of the, I think, at a political level for all of us is to think about whether it's possible, nonetheless, to come up with versions which are shared, which is not repeating the divisions within society. <coughs> um, in Cyprus, we were trying to look at some of the, some of the example, and then you see uh, sort of the, the church, the religious monument, they're very often the, the, the most sensitive to this kind of discussion. And you see on each side either the conversion of churches or mm -hmm. rebuilding of new mosques, sort of a change in the heritage scapes. And it's very interesting to see a, a great sort of a social insecurity about what is going on, how can this happen, are they not appropriating, are they not changing in some way what our identity or what our culture is about. We also had one case of an very ancient ship that truly belonged to all Cyprus and everyone could have potentially felt proud about, but uh, we could see there that past politicization of who actually <coughs> that heritage belonged most to had already in some way polluted, if one would say it, people's attitude. It wasn't possible to, in any simple way, making it into a, a shared one. The next case is Bosnia, and I hope you, I'm just trying to pull out of each case so you can see that the issue which are so very distinct and yet very shared between them. Uh, I put those two pictures together deliberately. They're photographed from the same space. The right-hand one is the one you would see most often. That's a picture of the Mostar Bridge. If you go to the left hand, then that's looking from the same point, but down the river, and you can see it's religiously a uh, divided city. The mosque has been rebuilt with a minaret taller than ever before, and the church has been built with a tower which is taller than it ever, ever was before. And there is no visual, the visual clue to, to the religious divided city are very, very strong. And this has all happened after the symbolic rebuilding of the Mostar Bridge was supposed to unite the two sides. <coughs> so in Bosnia, we were in the situation of having three ethnic groups, which um, with great uncertainty in terms of future, continuation of conflict, politics, who's doing what and how. And we looked at a number of cases. We looked at the Mosta Bridge. We looked at the Tukare, which is the Shaparunitia Memorial Complex. And then we actually also looked at how they reinterpret the shared past. So for example, how the Second World War monument, which was erected while Tito was gaining power, how they're now being reinterpreted in various ways. So that things which was originally erected to, sh to unite the Yugoslavia and to show people as one people who have suffered and built it are being reinterpreted, sometimes by falsely using history to actually say, no, it's not correct that say on the monument that all Yugoslavia was behind it. It was actually only Serbs who did it, or it was actually only uh, Muslims who did it. So there, there's a very totally unashamed reinterpretation of a lot of existing cultural heritage, which uh, is driving very much towards ethnic cleansing in terms of history. Then we have one case, which is Tusla, which during the Bosnian war was one of the few safe haven of multi-ethnic uh, community, and where they have tried to make memorial grounds where victims for both sides are buried together, and where uh, the same symbols are used for the youth. The, uh, there was a major um, massacre or catastrophe which happened which affected both sides. And it was very much driven by the family, very much driven by the mothers. The insistence on these have been boyhood friends. They should not be separated in, in death. So it's a one example of a potentially some uh, a memorial or a reflection on what happened to your children which was moving toward trying to maintain the un united community. <clears throat> so from the Bosnia, which 
the every, one, every single one of our case studies were complicated, but Bosnia is psychologically very, very complicated to participate in. Uh, we learned a lot about the complexity of mourning and memorialization. Absolutely shockingly, you sort of leave places and feel at one hand totally emo emotionally drawn in and at another hand politically totally scared of what they're doing. Um, at another level we see the heritage and that kind of claims on history being used in new kinds of identity formation, new kind of a nation building, and in some way one could talk about warfare by other means. This is not, there's no peace in what that heritage is being used for. It is being used to create the others. Um, we also see the privatization of cultural heritage and the role of a state in various ways. There's a lot of external money coming into Bosnia, focusing on rebuilding, and those money are, take part, are partial. They, uh, they, want, they are invested in particular visions of what Bosnia should be about. They are often political and religiously informed visions about Bosnia, which I thought was, is, is very, very uh, complicated. We also saw a lot about the role of the international communities in the case of Bosnia and the EU, and one of the things we tried to see if we could make a policy recommendation is about was that how careful external communities and bodies have to be about not, when they go back into the situation, they don't go in with a sense of blame. A lot of what we have done in the name of the international community or the EU have created a very strong rhetoric of the victims and those to be blamed in the rebuilding of society. So in some way the conflict are again continued into to sort of the investment, I think. Um, Germany, we look at Dresden, which was one of our old cases, and we looked at the, sort of the huge, again, investment of, uh, in reconstruction of a particular place the Frauenkirch, which was also initiated with a lot of external money. And uh, in some way, it is much more ambivalent than the tourist leaflets would give you a sense of. This was the Hof Church of the Nazi Party, among other things. We also looked at um, the use of the cemetery for the collective memorialization and the attempt of various uh, extremist groups, both on the right and the left, of appropriating what those, <coughs> the memorialization of 13 of February should be about. Very radical, very aggressive. It's, get back, you have, you have to have like 30,000 police out in the street uh, doing the memorialization event because it's, it's become sort of kind of an ideological battleground. Um, at the same time, it is also very much a physical space. It's a landscape of memory, and everything which happened so far, generation after, is in various ways informed and guided by that understanding, and by a very complex attempt of balancing the sense of that individual could be <coughs> victims, while they could, should not be excused from being part of Nazi Germany. So they have a political, psychological, very interesting and complex balancing act, which have influenced that whole reconstruction process. Okay, I have a few uh, text slides that I shall try and get through quick. I want to try to give a sense of that when you get emerged in this kind of case study, you, you discover a lot of things, you have a lot of findings, you have a lot of information or reflections which link to your concern with heritage, conflicts, and identity. But they are very um, abstract in a way. So one of the things which is very obvious is that heritage is malleable. That it's, uh, but at the same time, it can also resist interpretation or reinterpretation. So its meaning is changeable, it can be conservative, it can go different ways. And that is a very general finding. But it's, of course, quite difficult to, to do something with that. So you sort of feel, I'm very, as a researcher, I'm really generally thinking, I'm discovering and learning something of tremendous importance in terms of understanding the nature of heritage. But what use does it have? 
Then we also uh, would argue that there's a tendency for Harris to, to be, be influenced by these essentializing discourses, discussions that may, may only give space for two groups, one and the other. It's always about the opposition. There is not room in this kind of tense situation for nuances uh, of interpretation or nuances of identity. And again, I think it's very, very important, and we can see it in our data, situation <coughs> after situation. But if I go to politicians and say so, they will probably just say that's very interesting and move on, it, because it's difficult to use. You, they may be a little bit warned about, let's be careful about it. We also discovered that, herit that heritage, and I would say memorials as well, can have a negative role in post-conflict societies because how it gets linked to specific groups um, and in some way the second next point and become a means of repeating claims or maintaining a sense of claim or, repetition, uh, or reparations or specialness. So the memorials uh, play very central and very important roles but I think it's important that we realize that they are not just necessarily positive. It is also a way of keeping a memory of a conflict alive and memorials are very, very rarely about all that who were involved. They do take part, they do, do take sides, I think. And that I think maybe politicians should be a little bit more able to respond to. Uh, and then the last point, that there's a great fluidity between tangible and intangible aspect of heritage and its meaning. I'm not sure, it, it really matters a lot to me. I think it's incredibly important, <laughs> but I'm not really sure what people can do with that. So, then we try to go the next steps and sort of say that we find within this kind of situation, what do we actually find? We find the need to, we find there's a need to legitimate action and to support rights and also a tendency of searching for support for certain kinds of claims. That that's one of the characteristics, that you are frail in your sense of identity and claims, so you do search for that has been challenged, and you search for things which support your claims. It also leads to a tendency to present very simplistic and partial versions of events, including historical. There are a lot of disputed historical claims going on in this kind of situation. <coughs> There's a tendency to construct notions of victims, including heritages, heritages itself, buildings, spaces, landscapes, there are a lot of victims in various ways. There's also a lot of disputes about whether they are actually victims. There's a formulation of new ownership claims. For example, also even regard to who were here first, like in some kind of abstract beginning of time. There's competition for international attention. If you get the international committees on your side, you are much, much stronger placed. And then there's the constructions of symbol <coughs> and iconic events and places and memorials, of course, part of that. So maybe one could go into this and say, okay, here there's something to put out for politicians or practitioners. Let's be careful about what kind of events we create. Let's uh, be careful about the language we use. If you speak about victims, have you thought about who agree to this being victims? Um, to what extent are we agreeing to the claims to understand the repercussions of claims arising from different groups? So I think one could potentially go into this kind of findings, but we're not there. What we actually said, and I've, uh, this is totally admittedly very compromised, it was because we need to say something to the EU, and because first, we needed to stay um, true to our academic findings. And secondly, whenever I were coming up with something more solid, the people, the research team from Bosnia would say, if you say that, it will cause that and that. And none of the things we wanted to have, uh, have, have happening. So what we learned very, very much about was how difficult it is to come up with generic recommendation with regard to this kind of situation, with regard to the heritage and identity and conflict or post-conflict. That 
it is so uncontrollable how it will be interpreted at local levels and therefore how it will be used. <coughs> if I may briefly go through them and then I'm almost finished. So we were very much trying to say one need to avoid practices that avoid that the cultural heritage or the reconstruction become a point of conflict, another point of conflict, that the conflict doesn't just get it dressed up in a new way. And that's why I was sort of slightly referring to shared heritage. I think in our reconstruction policies and in our reconstruction psychology, we are largely thinking backwards rather than forward. We are doing it in terms of what has happened le rather than what could happen in the future. And I think that is very, very difficult to learn to think differently. We were also concerned with an emphasis on uh, authenticity, which uh, this comes straight forward from the issue about rebuilding, that there is, in, at any international expert group or advice, there's a strong emphasis on authentic authenticity when you rebuild buildings, which, for example, mean that the Mostar Bridge had to be built by Turkish workers, otherwise it's not authentic. The craft is authentically ethnic. So there is some really, really important consideration in terms of understanding authenticity. And being able to maintain some kind of authenticity without marginalizing the groups who should be immediately involved. We were also concerned and trying to uh, phrase that we think that there is a need for financial scrutiny of donors. And there are the political scientists in the project say, you can't say that kind of thing. It can't happen, it can't be done. And I recognize that. But I still sort of keep it in. Because the external funding sources are actually largely coming in with a desire from outside about how the society should look. They are invested in the future. And so, for example, the mosque in Bosnia and 90%, I think 95% of them was destroyed, and I think about 90% have been reconstructed. But they have re been reconstructed as South Arabian mosques, not as Bosnian, not as Central European mosques, because the money have come from the Philippines and sort of Arabia and other places. So you have a totally changed heritage scape, which may be good, may be bad, I don't know, but it certainly is no one have participated in those discussions. So the financial donors come in with very often very specific intentions. And also, we think that it's very important that, they, that what happened in terms of rebuilding get disassociated from issues of establishing truth or claims. It's not because you were, were treated worse that we are rebuilding this. If you do that, you continue the sense of they do ignore us. They, uh, it's, very, it's very sort of typical in Bosnia that in some area, well, for example, in terms of food or rebuilding houses, there was simple going through villages and is establishing who was ethnically what, and depending on your ethnicity, your house would be rebuilt, not just because your house was destroyed and you lived in that village. So that had caused a lot of problems, long-term problem in the area. Then there also issue about long-term engagement and the political aims and so on, as you try and, and, and finish. So when I look at my, our recommendations, there are warnings, there are reflections, there are qualitative, uh, there are not guidelines, guidelines they're not hard statements that are not quantitative. We could not squeeze that out of our research and in any way feel uh, maintaining a sense of integrity. So I think what we say is in some way ambiguous when actual practice is exactly the kind of situation where it's not helpful to be ambiguous. For example, our concept of authenticity, we say they shouldn't emphasize it and yet they shouldn't let anything, everything happen. So we are very unclear in some way. Um, and we also try all the time to be non-partial, to be not political. At the same time as whatever we say uh, will be interpreted in situations which are political and where anything which is said is interpreted political. 
And I think that is, for example, in Bosnia, just the fact that we traveled through and looked at it came out in the newspaper that Cambridge University was finally recognizing that Serbs have been ill-treated in Bosnia. <laughs> you know, you hadn't said anything, you had just been present. It was very, very difficult to, in any way, to safeguard how your presence or statements could be used. And that is something which the EU, for some reason, are totally on a way of, that you can't just save things without it having effect. <clears throat> so I've thought that in terms of impact, which uh, I'm sure must be very much in your mind, I've thought that maybe there are actually several steps. I've only started to see the first two. Well, the first is, I think, what we have done with lists of recommendations, which in fact are just reflections, uh, which have a lack of clarity about how they will be instrumentalized. They are general rather than specific, um, and they're disseminated or recommended without any target. So you say something and you have no sense of what will happen. And I thought then the second step, which we're slightly trying to do now, is see if we can find a way of targeting our recommendation. And we've thought there were two kind of structures. One is actually tools which affect what's happening. And that is, for example, the legal structures, what they say should or shouldn't do. For example, the convention about uh, the 1954 Hague Convention about heritage mm -hmm. and law. Um, the other is what kind of experts sit in different kind of committees. Uh, the third one is how we, the rules about architectural thinking. And one should also think about the media think. And then the other thing we thought we could target which actually go to particular stakeholders, such as UNESCO or World Bank or iCommerce, and say, this is your aims, this is what you say you want to do, this is how you do it, and based on our research result, we think you, will, you, uh, you have this problem. So that's, uh, we don't know, I don't know how to do it, but that's how far we've come. We think we need to learn how to target it, our research outcome, in a way that we understand better who we're talking with and what we're saying to them. So thank you very much. Okay, well we have some uh, time for uh, questions and, and, and comments and a bit of discussion. And I would ask if uh, people would uh, you use the mic because we, we would like to uh, have these uh, webcasts. So. Thanks very much. Um, um, there's a range of different things I'd like to ask you about, but one of the things that struck me, and maybe you could say a little bit more about, was the point you made um, in one area where it was about the selection of what was deemed important to be preserved as cultural heritage. Uh, so some things were selected and some things weren't, and the, the politics obviously around that, maybe you could say a little bit more about how that... Yeah. Um, has played out in different areas. Yeah, that of course happens uh, everywhere, but I think usually we're not aware of how politicized it is. But in some, for example, in the Cyprus case study, you could see that there's a very interesting political <coughs> attention to it because at one level they neglect the heritage of the other. They will not really look after it. Uh, or they will re reuse it, they will turn a mosque into a church or something like that. And then at times they select one of the others and do a big thing about restoring it so the international community can see how they uniquely they preserve and look after it even that it's not their heritage. So it's almost like, it's, uh, and this is a particular building, as if the buildings have become part of a political game or showmanship. Um, so that we see a little bit single case is pulled out uh, and restored. And I think actually the Master Bridge, I don't know, there's someone here who worked on the Master Bridge, or oh, it was that in another project. But the Master Bridge, the World Bank and, and a few other sponsors 
focus on reconstructing this bridge as this very symbolic gesture of uniting the hands over the river, uniting the, the community. But when you drive up to the Master Bridge, you still have the ruined houses and streets and bullet holes and so on. So uh, they put a lot of money into this showmanship of reconstruction and uh, neglected all the rest. So there is some very interesting process of selection, which I think sometime in this kind of conflict situation seem to be about showing off something rather than so in our more recent thinking, we have tried to see if one can address this thing about having more joined up thinking so, so, so that social economic development go, go together with heritage development, that it's that the reconstruction of your heritage is not isolated from the fact that society has to function as well. It's, uh, I think one of the most dramatic examples is in some ways the Bamiyang statue where I think only recently they have given up reconstructing them. But millions have been put in to try to reconstruct and glue those poor statues together in a country so poor and so much in need of having those million invested in other ways. So that whole sort of being aware of the, the policy of selection, which is both about how you use resources, but also what you give priority to. Um, we have, is this working okay? Yeah. Um, we have a, a tourism industry here, I think, that very much uh, focuses on several things, but on, in particular on, on tours, uh, doing tours around the areas and uh, giving a narrative to try, try to yeah. explain the different sites. Um, is there anything comparable, you know, that you would point to in, in some of the research you've done? And also, uh, forms of touring that actually subvert a little bit some of the preconceived uh, narratives or mythologies mm -hmm. maybe negotiate the spaces on either side and 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 try to weave and you know at an intangible level perhaps some kind of other uh, more complex yeah. um, story i've thought uh, i've thought it's fun but there's taxi tours which are emerging here i think it's very very interesting i have to say it really look forward to hear you all investigating it. The, the one uh, example, a little bit the same, or similar maybe, is in Sarajevo, where you can be taken on tours uh, by people who were there doing the siege of Sarajevo and out to the tunnels and so on. But that is a very partial one. So they, uh, and I think what is maybe unique here is, as far as I understand, your taxi driver can be from either side, or you can be a lock in, have you can have one and then swift and you get another. So it's not that you're only getting one side of the story. We have thing mostly in most other cases you're actually giving the insider's side to the story and only get there for one side of it. So I don't know if it's unique, but I can't I don't know if anyone else here know about other cases. It's also interesting that it's sort of not just a big tour operator, but seem to come a bit from uh, from inside the sort of smaller com co companies. Yeah. I, I, I just, uh, I know from talking to an Austrian friend of mine, an artist in, in Vienna, this is a slightly different uh, location obviously, but um, they'd been working on a particular site, I think it was a village that still exists, but it actually had been more or less a concentration camp mm. uh, during the 1940s, and, and they wanted to, to, to you know, bring this back into in, into consciousness again. You know mm. that uh, the, the terrible things that had gone on here, but the difficulty was then negotiating the relationship with the local people who were living there, yeah. and felt besmirched by this. And then um, what my friend was part of was a project where they created uh, a recording that you could put on your. Um, headset yeah. and walk around and get a sense of what this other story was and what those buildings once were used for. Of course, that then was difficult. Yeah. <laughs> These people walking around wearing headsets, you know. Yeah. But it, it points up some of the complexities of trying to uh, look under the surface yeah. um, in, in, that in that kind of way. Yeah, I think we were slightly shocked about that our old case studies actually had a lot of contemporary attention in them still. like. Gernicke and Dresden and 
even the one from 1864 that so if there are things one can understand so that the process of healing or recovery can be helped and speeded up I think that would be a tremendous importance does it have resonance what I said to the kind of thing you're working with I just wanted to ask if you saw any examples where you felt culture was genuinely shared. Because we have a number of contested spaces which both communities use and both communities memorialize in different ways. So did you see any, exa any examples of it where that was done, done well and how we may be able to learn from it? Uh. Uh, the Tusla case in Bosnia is an example, but it's very fragile and it's just one place. There's, um, in the border region between Denmark and Germany, I'm, I'm from that region, so I did a small case study there, which is the one from 1864. The government of the two sites are now insisting that the war memorial places and the big uh, memorial places uh, have to be shared spaces. And that was very, I, I'm from the region myself, so all my emotions say, oh, no, 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 how could we see anything with the Germans? It would be terrible. They did this in 1864, so. Uh, and it's really quite shocking to, to find that split in yourself, that emotionally you can be tied up in, in this kind of response. And I thought it was actually very important to realize that it, it's very difficult for it to come from local communities where in a lot of sort of heritage and social practice we talk so much about bottom-up. And I do think we have to realize we need both processes because local communi cannot, communities cannot, I think, that easily free themselves from that heavy inheritors of, of conflict and, and mourning. And you might need people who are from outside to do it. But from outside you don't have the sensitivity to do it in a way where it's really work. So I think one need uh, to, to have those two processes to work together. And uh, in, in that border region between Denmark and Germany, they are now, for the first time, the last April, the Danish and German soldiers were marching together on the Memorial Day. And you got all kind of letters to the newspaper, but they did march together. And all the letters were only from the local regions. Uh, so maybe that would mean that in a ten years time it will be naturalized. I think it's this, that thing about time, temporal span of, uh, but it is, it is in a way deeply depressing to see how knotted up many of the situations become and how un, uh, unsophisticated we have been in terms of helping those processes to to, to move forward to, to heal, for people to heal better. And I think civil war or war within community are the ones which are worse. Then uh, the world war, uh, uh, the, the lines which are driven between people heal much easier, better and quicker, I think. I was interested just in how you selected your case study sites. You know, you must have had a lot of possibilities to work with. How did you decide which within Europe you would focus on and then which would be the, the bigger and smaller case yeah. studies? Um, first, I have to say we had approached someone in Ireland, and but I did put the project together rather quickly. I just suddenly realized I wanted to do it. And she did manage to reply in time. And with EU, you have to get it in, you have to have your partners and so on. So it was, I think, if the social scientist here, it was a snowballing approach, kind of. You knew some people and asked them and so on. So we had a wake, we actually had a sense of the region. I was interested in having some of the old conflicts, conflict area. And then it was obvious that we also needed to look at some contemporary. So um, Cyprus and Bosnia was useful. But it was actually very, very difficult to find researchers for Bosnia because uh, 
that I thought we could not have people in Bosnia. There would never be any legitimacy in what they were saying. So we needed to find, so we find someone in Sweden and someone in Greece, someone who could, who were expert in the areas, but who were not living or working in it, where the, all the other partners were in, in, from the living in the countries. But it was, uh, I think as, as a lot of research and a lot of good research, uh, it was a lot of random factors, so it was like this would be interesting if if this were, if not Germany, then maybe Poland, or if not Bosnia, maybe we could do it Croatia. So, no. so we knew what kind of area. So the one which fell out was Belf, uh, was uh, Ireland, and that was just because of timing. But. Um, well, you know, with a lot of research, if you have, if you had started at the beginning, I, I, I could not have had a better team. It was the most fantastic group of people, and they're to totally cross or transdisciplinary, whatever one wants to say. Um, we were two archaeologists, but only one practicing. That's me. We were cultural geographer, psychologists, historians, human geographer, um, social anthropologists, political scientists, and I think. I think that because the problem, the issue we were looking at, demanded that, it really worked. It was none of us, when it came to it, felt expert on anything. And that actually meant we could work really well together. It was never like some discipline was controlling it and this is how one do it. So we, we, I thought we very generally learned from each other. But the case studies were slightly different, so the, the ones who did Boston are all political scientists. So. Uh, you had to teach them about heritage, and then they suddenly realized that heritage is all about politics, and they got very excited. Uh, but but it, uh, if, if I had l known what I know now, I would also have been more, I would have stopped the research quicker or earlier and spent more time in trying to comprehend what we had learned. But then that, of course, would have shortened the research period. But that, that was the most difficult of it. We had one big meeting in Paris where we were trying to come up with the research recommendation or policy recommendation. That was the only meeting which didn't work. Whatever anyone said, someone else said, but that if you said that, this would happen in Guernica or this would happen in Sarajevo and so on. So that, that was really difficult. Yeah, you have seen how little hay way we have done. That's about all where we are. Uh, it's very, very hard. And I think, you know, I, I did not want to compromise academic or political integrity. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. And it's better to look at it as a failure than to save things that you think could be dangerous to say or save things you know you have no ba basis for saying. But you nonetheless want to see if you can, because I, I read, you know, you don't do this kind of work unless you feel very strongly committed. You want to try and see if you can do it better. So we've done a lot of sort of creating sort of work papers, setting them out, trying to get them to say, with any big research project, your researcher do their own thing unless you have meetings. In meetings, you can get everyone to talk about everything. So we have had quite a lot of meetings. And we had some meetings where we specifically tried to talk about what we had found and our results. And so trying to, and, and try to create sort of template about, you should think about whether your, whether your findings relate to this and this kind of issues. So we are slightly, we haven't tried to dictate and we haven't had, you can have some kind of structure where there's some of the people who do the findings and some who do the data analysis. So we all done the same. We haven't had that division. And that makes it more exciting, also slightly more difficult in terms of getting people to extract that, that sort of insight. Uh, but I think it means that the insight does stay very close to what we have actually observed and seen. Does that answer? Could I ask you? 
Could I ask you about the tension in your different sites between actual material heritage and the ritual commemorative practices that took place? Because it seemed you, 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 in relation to the German case, you, mm. you gave us a sense that that was very problematical and highly yeah. politicized. But um, I can't think in the case of the, the, the uh, Mostar Bridge, for example, you know, you don't have that same kind of commemorative thing. No. And um, that sort of, once you get into the commemorative events and this kind of uh, propagation, if you like, of com the combat myth and, and of common enemy and so on, uh, it becomes much more contested. Could you say just a little bit yep. about, about that? I think, uh, I think it's a very interesting point you make. And in our research, we have some uh, reconstruction projects which, which are about buildings or bridges. Or, uh, and they can become focus of memorialization. They can in themselves become that, but they don't need to be. They can also play a uh, potentially quite more, more subtle role in terms of for example, going to mass in the reconstructed uh, Frauenkirche is also uh, in some way calling forth a lot of symbols. But I think it is right that there's a difference, in most cases there's a difference between the reconstructions of houses and buildings and churches and then actually those, those monuments which create, which is about the event and is about memory about that event. And they are uh, they're the ones where it seemed to be almost impossible not to it build into them some kind of contested claims or some kind of claims. So I think in terms of peace building and, and building societies, it is the memorialization and the different aspect of that which we have to be most scrutinized as the, the most critically in terms of thinking about whether we're doing the right things. Um, where, but it doesn't mean that the buildings are entirely innocent either because there's a lot of decisions about who's building or what building or why one rebuilt, why, why one invest in rebuilding the mosque or not the churches, for example. So, so there are a lot of politics and a lot of claims on involved in sort of investment in who's right, what's going on in the billscape as well. But the politicization is most explicit in the meeting we had before in terms of Dresden, with these pictures are from Dresden. The first memori memorial event for the bombing of 13 of February happened uh, the year after, before the war was actually over, in the midst of the chaos of the war, political, they, when they, they could see where, how the war was going and they already moved in and start claiming that space. And we have been able to follow through archives every year since 1945. And you can see, for example, that the, uh, the communist regime, how they use the memorials. And then how different opposition groups or sort of a group in hiding were using the memorials. So, for, for, a lot of, for some groups in East Germany, it's very controversial that they rebuild it because it was a ruin which was of memory. And that had been, they used to put uh, candles on the ruins, which was laying like a pyramid in the middle of the town. And they used to put candle on it on the 13th of February to remind the world that they were still there. So that incredible uh, emotive uh, and potent symbols that the old people had is now replaced with this sort of pristine reconstruction. So the, the, the places can also be layered. Yeah. You, you asked about uh, lessons that we might apply to Ulster, to Northern Ireland, and. Uh, yeah. 
I think maybe you would have appreciated from the deadly silence that followed your question <laughs> that we're all very wary about making any statements of any, uh, any that you know could be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. It is such a sensitive issue. But I just um, would proffer the, the thought, and it's only a personal thought, um, that one has to build upon shared what, what are perceived to be neutral spaces mm -hmm. or shared spaces. And um, uh, until recently, I think my perception is that central Belfast, the shopping area of central Belfast, would have been perceived as a neutral shared space. Sadly, that has been drastically overcome now with, with the flags dispute and the you know, parading of uh, the, the culture from one side uh, at the expense of the other. That's my perception. Uh, the other point I was going to make um, in terms of lessons that we can learn, um, to what extent <coughs> is the uh, demonstration of reconciliation by political leaders uh, something that can be uh, cr can result in profound change. Um, I think in terms of you know looking at South Africa and Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. who who represented reconciliation and forgiveness in a profoundly important way. Uh, sadly, things again have changed latterly. But then again, in Northern Ireland, we had um, the two political extremes coming together. Uh, in the guise of uh, Paisley and McGuinness, Martin McGuinness, apparently um, being reconciled and apparently being friendly and demonstrating to their own sections of the community that uh, forgiveness and reconciliation could be could be achieved. Um, I'm just proffering those those two areas as perhaps lessons that we might might mm. learn uh, from your talk uh, yeah. today. I, I certainly, in terms of the, uh, thank you for the first point, and in terms of the second point, the, the sort of symbolic ha holding hands of Cole and Mitterrand on Verdun is clearly <coughs> being built into the myth of it's having become a different place now. So I, d I do think, uh, and uh, Sarkozy and Merkel have also been, been doing those kind of symbolic gestures. So I, uh, it's very easy just to sort of laugh a bit about it, but I think you're right that it actually, it, to create as many statements of reconciliation at different levels, I think uh, is something one should not underrate. Marie Louise, I, I think I'll um, I'd like to thank you. We, we, we get to continue this perhaps over lunch, and we might want to talk to you individually. And or maybe people want to say something that they don't want to.